Unveiling the Chilling Realities of Mexico's Dirty War, Erased History, 1958-2000. Step into the shadows of history as we delve into one of Mexico's most chilling chapters, the Dirty War that unfolded from 1958 to 2000. This period, shrouded in secrecy and repression, saw a harrowing struggle between the ruling institutional revolutionary party, and political opposition, both democratic and armed. Amidst arbitrary arrests, decades-long incarcerations, indigenous community massacres, high-profile political assassinations, and an array of horrifying crimes, Mexico experienced an era of turmoil that history has often chosen to forget. Join us as we unearth the sinister truths of this forgotten war, inviting you to subscribe to our channel and stay updated with our explorations. Number 1. Origins of the Dirty War, the Cristero Conflict To comprehend the roots of Mexico's 20th century Dirty War, we must glance back at the Cristero War that raged between 1926 and 1929. During the presidencies of Plutarco Elias Calles and Emilio Portsgill, this conflict pitted the Mexican government against the clergy and Catholics. The unresolved tensions from the Cristero War gave rise to a second phase, the Low Intensity Second Cristero War, 1932-1941, marked by sporadic clashes and governmental persecution of Catholics and conservatives, irrespective of the official battles. Number 2. Precursors to Repression, Fraudulent Elections Notably, Mexico's journey into the dirty war terrain was predated by two fraudulent federal elections, those of 1929 and 1940. The extraordinary election of 1929, following the assassination of Álvaro Obregón, showcased an outrageous sham where Pascual Ortiz Rubio of the National Revolutionary Party secured a supposed 100% victory against conservative José Vasconcelos. Fast forward to 1940, when Manuel Avila Camacho's victory was contested by opponent Juan Andreu Almazon, amidst a violent electoral campaign, that left numerous casualties. Number 3, Repression after Miguel Enriquez Guzman's defeat, 1952. The flames of the Dirty War began to flicker in 1952 after General Miguel Enriquez Guzman's electoral defeat. Historians place the roots of this era in his election loss to Adolfo Ruiz Cortines of the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Guzman, aspiring to follow in Lázaro Cárdenas's footsteps, faced an election riddled with irregularities, sparking protests that were brutally suppressed by Miguel Olemán Valdez's government. The path toward the full-blown dirty war was now unmistakable. Number 4 the imprisonment of Demetrio Vallejo, 1959. A pivotal figure in this narrative, Demetrio Vallejo, a railway union leader, was incarcerated in 1959. Emerging from humble beginnings as a telegraph operator in Oaxaca, Vallejo's path led him to the Mexican Communist Party. His bid to free the railway union from PRI control led to imprisonment by Adolfo López Mateos's administration. After 11 years in Lecumberi Palace, Vallejo's release in 1985 marked a short-lived political career, tragically cut short four months after becoming a federal deputy. Number 5, Sparking the Flame of Guerrilla Warfare, Late 1950s the sparks ignited by Demetrio Vallejo and Valentin Compa spread through labor sectors like oil and education, giving rise to pockets of resistance. However, these movements, suppressed by the government, laid the groundwork for communist-inspired guerrilla movements in the late 1950s. As the 1960s unfolded, these guerrilla factions, such as the Communist League of September 23rd, saw renewed life with the memory of the 1965 Madeira Barracks assault fueling their determination. Number 6, Atrocities on Both Sides of the Dirty War Unveiled This era's darkness was reflected in the activities of both sides. Mexican authorities employed counterinsurgency tactics involving disappearances and mistreatment of captured guerrillas. These insurgents suffered physical punishment in secret prisons, military bases, and the now-defunct Federal Security Directorate. Meanwhile, 
the guerrilla factions engaged in ambushes and assassinations, leaving soldiers dead, an aspect often veiled in silence. A grim reality emerged, where even the expression soldiers never die concealed the loss of army personnel. Number 7, Peasant Movements and Land Occupation in Chihuahua. In the state of Chihuahua, a groundswell of peasant movements emerged, marked by land invasions and steadfast resistance against police evictions. The Sierra de Madera movement, led by various social organizations including the General Union of Workers and Peasants of Mexico, found formidable leaders in figures like Arturo Games Garcia and Dr. Pablo Gomez Ramirez. This movement saw the occupation of lands owned by large estates and stood resilient against police efforts to dislodge them. In August 1963, with the support of around 300 peasants, the movement established the community center named after Professor Francisco Lujana Dame, advocating for land distribution from the Panitas, and Ojo de Pueco Haciendas. Number 8, The Inspiration of Heroclio Bernal on Northern Revolutionary Movements. In late 1963, the first Sierra Heroclio Bernal encounter took place, attended by activists and supporters of the Popular Socialist Party from five Mexican states. This gathering bore the name of the legendary 19th-century Sinaloan bandit Heroclio Bernal, who initiated a revolution in Chihuahua, and Durango with the call for justice and freedom. Despite his historic significance, Bernal met his end in 1888 when his hideout was betrayed to the authorities. The participants denounced the persecution of their leaders and the mistreatment by local power figures, while expressing solidarity with the Cuban Revolution. Number 9, Between 1963 and 1964, Land Occupations and Forced Evictions During this period, Chihuahua bore witness to land occupations and forcible evictions. The army and police engaged in evicting land occupants, arresting both peasants and leaders, in a bid to diminish the growing social influence. Salvador Gaetano Aguirre, a leader of the Popular Socialist Party, won the municipal election in Isbadilla de Dolores, a municipality dominated by the powerful José Ibarra. This victory further bolstered the movement, while escalating hostilities from both Ibarra and Chihuahua's governor, General Praxedes Gaina Duran. Number 10, President Diaz Ordos's response to escalating tensions. As the clamor for land distribution, promised by the Mexican Revolution, intensified, peasants engaged in marches, rallies, land takeovers, and protests. Facing mounting pressure, President Gustavo Diaz Ordos, in office since December 1964, found himself at a crossroads. The peasantry demanded what had been pledged to them in support of the revolution. In response, Diaz Ordos instructed the Attorney General to de-escalate tensions, releasing those imprisoned. Government agronomists and experts began preparations for land distribution. Number 11, Government Closures of Suspected Subversive Schools To counteract growing dissent, the government labeled certain schools as subversive centers and shut them down. Tensions soared as members of the General Union of Workers and Peasants of Mexico, including Hugo C.M., destroyed a bridge on land owned by Ibarra, an act interpreted by the government as an armed action. Simultaneously, the governor ordered the closure of four normal schools and two boarding schools, all identified as fomenting subversion. Number 12, Emergence of the Popular Guerrilla Group, 1964. In 1964, Chihuahua witnessed the birth of the Popular Guerrilla Group. This insurgent organization, politically directed by Games Garcia and Gomez Ramirez, established a military branch led by Solomon Gaitan. Engaging in bold actions, the guerrillas set fire to the Ibarra family home, attacked a police barracks, and clashed with an army company and members of the judicial police. Their propaganda strategy involved sending letters exposing abuses by the army and local elites. Number 13, a Guevarist-inspired Mexican guerrilla movement. February 1965 saw the second Sierra Heroclio Bernal encounter, attended by members of the popular guerrilla group. 
embracing Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare tactics practiced during the Cuban Revolution, the group endorsed revolutionary struggle as the means to address social injustices. Dismissing them as criminals, the government refused to acknowledge their status as social fighters, leading to accusations of murder and cattle theft. Number 14, Planning the Assault on Madera Barracks, Emulating the Moncada Attack Operating covertly in Mexico City, the popular guerrilla group held secret meetings and gained new members, deliberating on both electoral and armed strategies. On May 5, 1965, Salvador Gaetana Aguirre, municipal president of Cibadilla de Dolores, took up arms, arresting and disarming local chieftain Emilio Raskin on charges of exploiting peasants. Concurrently, the group occupied Ranch El Durosno, detaining landowner Roberto Jimenez. Escaramuses with soldiers ensued, with the guerrillas establishing themselves in the mountainous border region between Chihuahua and Durango. Supported by reinforcements, they prepared to emulate the Moncada barracks assault in Cuba, a significant milestone in the Cuban Revolution's inception. Number 15, Disposing of Fallen Guerrillas in Ciudad Madera In a tactical move aimed at impacting military morale, the guerrilla assault on the Madera military barracks was meticulously planned in three groups. However, the complexities of the terrain led to the straying of two groups. As a result, a single group of 15 guerrillas carried out the attack, though they were ultimately defeated by the defenders of the barracks. This event, occurring on September 23, 1965, resulted in the deaths of eight guerrillas. Their lifeless bodies were transported through the streets of Ciudad Madera, piled onto an open truck, and ultimately discarded in the Plaza de Armas. There, the bodies remained until their burial the following day. Simultaneously, the military initiated a pursuit of the escaped guerrillas, employing four Air Force planes and 53 paratroopers. Number 16, Post-Failed Assault Fallout and Human Rights Violations Following the ill-fated guerrilla assault on the Madera barracks, a sweeping wave of human rights violations ensued. The army executed house-to-house -house searches, conducting arbitrary arrests and brutal interrogations. These interrogations included the involvement of General Tercio Garza Zamora, commander of the 5th Military Zone, and Governor Gaina Duran. In anticipation of further attacks, the military bolstered the barracks with paratrooper rifle battalions and hundreds of soldiers from various regions of Chihuahua and Sonora. These military actions persisted until the autumn of 1965, characterized by arbitrary detentions, communication disruptions, and physical punishments inflicted on innocent individuals mistakenly associated with the guerrillas. During this period, members of the popular guerrilla group moved to establish the 23 de Septiembre movement under the leadership of Pedro Oranga Rona, Juan Fernandez Carnio, and Saul Ornelas Gomez. Number 17, Guerrero's role as an epicenter of armed struggle. The state of Guerrero, too, witnessed the emergence of contestatory social movements and armed groups. During the 1960s, Guerrero stood out as a region plagued by inequality and oppression. As stated by Octaviano Santiago, the armed struggle in Guerrero during the 1960s was driven less by poverty and more by governmental authoritarianism, arbitrariness, intolerance, and the absence of public liberties. The Regional Union of Producer Cooperatives was founded in 1951, followed by the emergence of the Merchant Union of Coconut and its derivatives in 1957. These unions aimed to protect the interests of their members but became infiltrated and manipulated by both the government and entrepreneurs who perceived their businesses to be under threat. Number 18, Lucio Cabanas and the Kidnapping of a Senator and Gubernatorial Candidate Lucio Cabanas, Secretary General of the Federation of Socialist Peasant Students of Mexico, led a blockade of Mexico Tepec, Guerrero, using logs to halt the passage of timber trucks. This action protested the non-fulfillment of commitments by logging companies. The response saw the army being called in to suppress the striking workers and the population. 
Cabanius turned to guerrilla tactics, eventually kidnapping Senator Ruben Figueroa, a gubernatorial candidate, in April 1974. Figueroa was released in September of the same year, though whether a ransom was paid or his release resulted from a police operation remains unclear. Cabanius was ultimately killed by the army in December 1974 in the coffee-growing Otatal jungle. Number 19, The Suppression of Independent Unionism One of the recurrent abuses in Mexico was the practice of Charismo Syndical, identifying union leaders who prioritized employers' interests over those of their constituents. In 1967, members of unions subjected to Charismo Syndical attempted to democratize their organizations, inciting dissatisfaction among employers and vested organizations. On August 20, 1967, 800 workers, affiliated with unions infiltrated by Charismo Syndical, attempted to seize the headquarters of the Guerrero Producer Union. This endeavor was met with a violent response, police and hired gunmen fired upon the workers, resulting in 21 deaths and 37 injuries. Number 20, Genaro Vasquez's Mysterious Demise Another opposition leader in Guerrero who transitioned into guerrilla warfare was Genaro Vasquez Rojas, a schoolteacher. Similar to Lucio Cabanas, Vasquez founded the Civic Association of Guerrero and the Independent Peasant Central, opposing the government's actions. In 1960, he was imprisoned for alleged conspiracy and offenses against the governor, eventually escaping in 1968. He lived clandestinely and was recaptured in November 1966, dying in unclear circumstances in February 1972. Officially, he perished in a car accident when the vehicle he was in collided with a bridge on the Mexico Morelia Highway. Number 21, Ruben Jaramillo and his family's gruesome murder. One of the most heinous crimes committed by the Mexican state during the Dirty War was the assassination of Ruben Jaramillo, a farmer who fought during the Mexican Revolution. Later, he founded the Jaramillismo movement, active from the 1940s to the 1960s. Jaramillo, a Methodist pastor who sympathized with Mao, Fidel Castro, and Che Guevara, roamed the Morelos Mountains advocating for land redistribution and other rights. In May 1962, government forces surrounded the house where he was hiding with his pregnant wife and three sons. All were ruthlessly killed, except for his daughter Raquel, who managed to escape. Number 22, San Miguel Canoa Massacre. The circumstances surrounding the San Miguel Canoa Massacre, where five workers from the Autonomous University of Puebla lost their lives, turned it into a grim symbol of the intolerance that gripped Mexico during the era of the Dirty War. This event occurred on September 14, 1968, nearly 18 days after the Chilotilolco incident, a time when national tensions were at their peak. Young university workers had embarked on an excursion to the La Malinche volcano, and were staying in the village of San Miguel Canoa in the state of Puebla. Days before the university mountaineers arrived, local priest Enrique Meza Perez delivered an inflammatory speech against the student movement. Armed with machetes and clubs, the inhabitants of San Miguel Canoa attacked and killed the five young individuals along with the homeowner. This crime went unpunished. Number 23, Chilotilolco Massacre. On October 2, 1968, a gathering in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Chilotilolco was met with gunfire from government forces. This state-sanctioned atrocity is one of the most infamous crimes in Mexican history. The primary instigator of this massacre during Gustavo Díaz Ordos's administration was the Secretary of the Interior and future President, Luis Echeverria Álvarez. The successive PRI governments obstructed or prevented any objective investigation into the Chilotilolco massacre. It was only more than three decades after the event, in the year 2000 when Vicente Fox assumed the presidency, that the massacre was examined with a certain degree of impartiality. Echeverria passed away in 2022 at the age of 100 without facing appropriate punishment for his role in the massacre, having only endured a brief period of house arrest. 
Number 24, Corpus Christi Massacre, Halconazzo. On June 10, 1971, during Luis Echeverria Alvarez's presidency, a student demonstration in Mexico City was brutally gunned down. Approximately a thousand members of a paramilitary group known as Los Alcones, backed by soldiers from the Presidential Guard, police, and agents from the Federal Security Directorate, perpetrated this mass murder. In the unofficial tally of the Corpus Christi massacre, more than 225 individuals, the majority being teenage and young students, were shot and beaten to death. Number 25, A Haunting Reminder Despite the cloak of secrecy and silence cast by the Mexican state over the 20th century's dirty war, many Mexicans who endured it still recall those grim decades with horror. The adage that a people who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it remains poignant. If this video has been informative, kindly share your insights in the comments section. Don't forget to like and share this video with your family and friends. If you're new to our channel, make sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching. If you found this video interesting, make sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a like. We'll be back soon with more curiosities from history.